welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is another masterpiece from the wonderful mind of Jim Lawrence. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled The Wolves of October, Part 5. Let's get straight into that. The young girl walked next to the bayou in southeastern Louisiana, and she had been out walking to get away from people. She was teased and disliked by most of the children her age, all because they thought she was different. And children can be so cruel, and all because she loved animals. It didn't matter what animal, and she cared for them all. From the frog to the snake to the squirrel and deer, and she had tried to stop the boys from tormenting a sickly dog, and when she intervened, the boys decided tormenting her would be more fun. Now, all of her classmates teased her, and she was different. But she didn't care. She walked through the backwoods without care also. But she was so deep in thought that she didn't notice it was getting dark. And she wasn't afraid of the dark, but she knew it was time she headed back home. And she wasn't alone though. Cold, cruel eyes watched her. A long tongue ran along a row of sharp teeth and the muscle of the monster. Quietly, it stalked her edging ever closer as the last of the shadows crossed the sky and darkness fell. The creature attacked. The girl ran for her life, and as the thing she knew was a Rougarou, was chasing her, basking her in fear. The girl froze by a tree as the monster lunged for her, and she knew she was dead when a snap that sounded like thunder brought the monster up short. The creature had stepped into a bear trap. It howled in pain, but for all of its paranormal strength, it couldn't free itself from the trap. The cold forged iron of the trap had bit deep into its leg. At first it howled in defiance, and then it whimpered in pain. The girl had stopped running and returned to see the monstrosity reduced to a whimpering mass. Her heart dropped as she felt the sorrow, and she began to sing a song her grandfather had taught her. As she sang, the monster became a man, a man who pleaded for help. She cautiously approached the man, asking if I release you, will you harm me? She doesn't wait for the answer, moves closer, and tries to release the pin that holds the trap shut. After releasing the pin, she tries to stand on the spring. She looks up, saying, You'll have to help me. I'm not strong enough. The man manages to get enough weight on the spring to release it. The man stands free. He puts some herbs from a pouch on his leg, and that emits a green glow. The man looks at her, saying, Merci, mon petit. I am in your debt, a debt I will surely pay. Nicole awakes. Henri had given her a room in the family side of the mansion. Her dream was a pleasant one, because it was the day that started her on her journey. Lou leads Tony and his pack to the south. At this time, the great bear didn't follow. It had taken him considerable time to get out of that ravine he had fallen into and was at least two days behind the pack. The weather had proved the most difficult. The entire northwest was in the grip of a very heavy blizzard, and travel was slow, very slow. They had left the forest, heading for the land, the land where the ice moved across the land. The storm was a blessing and a curse. They normally could have made this trip in a few days, but the storm had them travelling at about half their speed but the storm had also kept any humans from discovering them, and with luck of the great spirit, they would make the land of the crawling ice tomorrow night. Jim Johnson had left his friends, telling them to head for Yellowstone, find Tom, and with any luck, he would meet them around his old ranger outpost. He headed to the Glacier National Park, and he figured that is where Tony and Lou would enter the United States, and this storm was the worst in several years. His tracking ability was all but useless. He knew that his brothers were okay, but he had to get them to the zone of death in Yellowstone. And he hoped that they could live a peaceful life there. 
Jim stands on a hilltop in the Glacier National Park and he's scanning the horizon. He says to himself, this is where they will cross. Jim knows the weather has played a large role in this taking so long. The north is engulfed in a polar vortex, causing terrible weather and slowing his friends down. He knows it will be so much faster to transform himself into a wolf and race to meet them, but he will wait. He knows he's starting to get comfortable with the change, and there is a danger of losing himself. For years, he had refused to take his true form. He feared the madness that afflicted his race, and so he stayed only in his human form, not allowing his senses to branch out, not allowing his true nature to take over. Even though he was more in tune with the primeval forest than any human, he was still not truly connected to the land. He starts to think of when this thing had started, the lies he had told. He knew of the supernatural creatures, he was one himself. His family was what the world called werewolves, though they didn't call themselves that. They referred to themselves as purebloods, wolfen. Jim hated the fact that most of his race thought they were superior to humans. Werewolves were the lesser creatures, and cursed creatures. He had spent his adult life the last 250 years hunting them down and killing them. He had let some live that showed that they had no desire to wantonly kill, if they promised to stay deep in the forests, far away from man. He had lied to his friend and supervisor Tom. He had told him that he was going to hunt a killer in the LBL. Well, that part wasn't a lie, but he didn't tell him he thought the killer was a rogue werewolf. At that time, he thought Tom would have had him committed, instead of sending him on a vacation. But when the killer turned out to be a dogman, his world was turned upside down. Where did these creatures come from? How did they come about? He had originally thought that somehow a werewolf had mated with a regular wolf, and this was the offspring. But his father had told him that they were from a First Nation tribe, and had the ability to take the forms of wolves to protect their people. But as any shapeshifter knew, if you stay in a form too long, you forget how to change back. And that had almost happened to Jim. After over a hundred years, he had found his way back to his true self. His cousin had told him that purpose was the key to not succumbing to the madness. And Jim had purpose. As God was his witness, he would keep his friends alive. He would keep what was left of his family alive. And he would see that these people that were trying to play God, the ones trying to create what we are, would not only be stopped, but would pay dearly. A wave of sorrow almost brings him to his knees as he thinks of Michelle. How wrong he was to have left her. Perhaps if he had not left her, he would have saved her. No, he thinks. Only she could have saved herself. Jim looks once more into the distance, into the whirling snowstorm, and sees something. He watches for a long while until he makes out a lone wolf, but this wolf is the size of a small horse. Jim runs to meet Lou and then notices that it is wounded. Boy, you gotta stop fighting bears. I wish I could hear the story. I'm sure it's a good one. Is the bear dead? Jim asks, like he almost expects Lou to answer. But Lou only gives him that look, but it's more than enough for Jim to understand that the bear is still alive. Later that night, Tony and his pack emerge from the surrounding forest. Jim has prepared for this moment, though. He greets his old friend, even though the rest of the pack stay back. And Jim had rented a truck which is large enough for the pack to ride unnoticed. The next morning, they are in Yellowstone and hiding in the forest. That night, they head for the zone of death and the small area Jim and Lou had stayed in. The area is wild and it's the dead of winter. Few people, even in the season, come to this area of the forest. Tony and his clan should be safe too. And happy here. And that bear is hundreds of miles away. Jim then says his farewells to Tony. Then looks at Lou and says, Okay boy, it's now time to head south. Henri needs us. The great bear had managed to escape the ravine. If animals are capable of hate, then the bear hated that wolf. How had he managed to escape him? He also hated the wolf that walked on two legs. Before this was over, they would be dead, and a meal for him. The bear was slowed, but not by much, and he trailed the wolves to the south, 
bears do not care about the borders of men. As he crosses into the USA, to him, it's only ice, and he knew the ice, and he knew how to track across the ice, a gift from his mother. The only difference was the storm. It was one of the harshest he had ever seen, but it didn't matter. He would find the wolves, and they would die. And then, the unthinkable. He lost the scent. Ah, a new scent assorted his nose. Was it the man thing? He smelled the wolf, but he also smelled the man. He also smelled metal, the stench of the machine that the human rode on. He was confused. He smelled both man and wolf. The large wolf had somehow conveyed to him that he didn't abandon this venture. He would have to face a man, a man not like any other. That didn't matter. He had killed men, and they were nothing but soft skin over brittle bones. He continued south. He would find them sooner or later. But he would find them. At the De Hue estate in Baton Rouge, Henri readied himself for dinner in his honour. After contributing $100,000 to a foundation for the preservation of the Red Wolves in Louisiana, the mayor was going to introduce him to the governor of the state. In truth, Henri cared little for this, but if he was going to play the part, he had to make a showing. Nicole hands him the itinerary for the evening, and he asks her what she will be wearing. I'm sorry, Henri. I will not be able to attend. I have been called to a meeting of my coven, and I may not decline. Henri shakes his head. Ah, that is unfortunate, my dear. I suppose I will simply attend by myself, as I see no way to escape it. No, Henri, you need not attend alone. You're presenting yourself as a pillar of this community. You must have an escort. May I suggest you ask Charlotte if she will attend with you? Nicole, do you not think it would cause some notice? And not to mention some ridicule if I took a swan to dinner? Also, I don't believe she would fill out a gown as well as you. Henri chuckles. No, silly, Nicole chides. Not the swan, but the lady I hired to keep the garden. Her name is also Charlotte, though I will warn you, her temperament. And that swans are somewhat similar, Nicole giggles. Then, my dear, I had best meet her. Henri walks away. You can hear him under his breath saying, Uncle, how did you do this? Putting up with the temperamental servants, animals, and having to play flop. James, you were so much more meant for this than I. A young lady is working in the garden, not quite as tall as Nicole, but with blonde hair and very pale, almost white skin. Henri observes her for a while and notices her grace and beauty. Before Henri can speak, she says, Good morning, Mr. Dehue. May I assist you? Henri looks surprised that she had noticed him, because even as a human, he walked as silent as the wolf he was. You are Charlotte, I take it. Yes, sir. I am Charlotte Ranger. Miss Nicole hired me to take care of the rare flowers and plants you have in a garden. May I say, Mr. Dehue, your estate is lovely. It is an honour to be employed here. Thank you, Henri says. My uncle was very particular of the grounds. Miss Ranger, I would like to ask you something. I find myself in need of an escort at dinner tonight. Nicole suggested you might attend with me. It is formal. I would be happy to provide you with a gown if you need one. I have a gown, Mr. Dehue, and I would be happy to be your escort. I have already spoken with Miss Nicole, and I would be honoured to attend. Lo, Mr. Dehue, I agree to be your escort for the evening, not the night. I assure you, Miss Ranger, your virtue will be intact. Are you staying on the estate grounds? She nods her head. Oh, good then. I'll pick you up at seven. At the dinner that night, Henri says to Charlotte, I hate these things. I know my uncle despised them also. We are of the land. The very foundation of the forest, only the lesser prowl, the cities. I know how you feel, Mr. DeHugh. I am like this too. You have received your reward. Is there any reason to stay longer? And before they can prepare to leave, a man calls out, Mr. DeHugh! Henri turns to see the man he knew as Turner, the one that came to the house looking for that abomination. Ah, Mr. Turner, 
I wasn't expecting you to be here. I must say I'm surprised. Like you, DeHue, as an officer of my corporation, I am expected to make nice with the leaders of the city. I see your admin assistant isn't with you, and I don't believe I know this lovely young lady. Another employee of yours? The man says with a seedy grin. Miss Ranger is my employee, but not as your jib suggests. She takes care of the rare flowers and plants in my private garden. Now, you owe her an apology, and have a care. In another time, such an insult would buy you a jewel. Ah, uh, yes, a pity, Turner says. In another time, you might be surprised. As both men begin to face each other down. Mr. DeHugh, Charlotte speaks. And you, sir, she stares daggers at Turner. I am quite capable of handling myself. Before either man can react, she slaps Turner solid across the face. Both he and her look a little surprised and she quickly regains her composure. I am ready to leave now, Mr. DeHugh. The air is, as well as the company, has gone very stale. She walks past Turner on her way out. Bon nuit, Mr. Turner, Henri says with a smile. You might want to put some ice on that as he leaves. When he enters the vehicle, Charlotte says, I beg your pardon, sir. I am sorry I lost my temper. Henri laughs. I am not. That was the best entertainment of the night. One more thing you should know, sir, she says. He's not normal. My slap would have stunned most men, but it actually hurt my hand. Henri contemplates this on the way to his estate. Not normal. No, defiantly not normal. And unless I miss my guess, he's not completely human either. His smell is totally off. Not a man, but also not a lesser. I will be seeing that man again, and maybe sooner than either of us want. The dream returns to Nicole that night, and again she is a child, playing next to the bayous, when she sees an old man walking up to her house. Visitors are rare, so she runs to see who would visit. Her mother talks with the elderly man, and seeing Nicole, she motions her over, and introduces him, and leaves them to talk. The old man tells the girl that he is the same man she had freed from the trap three days ago. He was a voodoo priest and he was here to repay her for her kindness. He tells her he had been talking to people about her and that he knew who her great grand aunt was. He then apologized for hunting her and said that a beast doesn't always care for who it hunts. He tells her he is glad that fortune smiled upon her that night and for her kindness to the beast and he was here to bestow a great gift to her. He then hands her a charm, a grisgris. He tells her that this will keep her safe as she walks in the bayous. No animal will harm her and may even help her if she is respectful. You have a great future, child. Use your powers wisely. She awakes in her bed and it is time to rise. It is time to deal with the ones that would take nature into their own hands. She prepares herself and goes downstairs to start her day. Henri seems deep in thought. He had received a text from his cousin James that he would be here in a few days and with guests. Henri didn't care about this. He was more concerned with his meeting with Turner. He had to know more. What was he dealing with? Was Turner one of these genetically enhanced creatures that thought they were the wolves? Was this his fate if Michelle's plan had succeeded? He must find out about this place before James arrived, so he could show his cousin that he was capable of dealing with this, and his help, though welcome, wouldn't be a necessity. He quickly shakes that off. James never cared about who was better or equal. That was just his own insecurities creeping in. He had no reason to be insecure anymore. He was the lord of his manor, he was one of the last purebreds in existence, his power second only to his cousin. He knew he was more powerful than Turner and any other abomination he could come up with. He strides over to the wall in the main hall. Two great bastard swords hang on the wall, one his cousin James's, the other one his. He pulls it from the wall and runs a finger along the razor edge. Soon it will be time to hunt, and God help his quarry.
If he wanted to play at making men into wolves, then it was time he saw what a true werewolf was. He was brought back to reality by the sweet voice of Nicole. Are you planning some sword practice today, my lord? Nicole says with a smile. I am hardly a lord in this day and time, Nicole. Even my uncle was fond of saying, To be nobility in this country, you must entertain the masses. I am afraid that entertainment I am planning will not bring joy to anyone but me. But enough of that. I trust your meeting with your uh, uh, constituents went well? Nicole says, Yes, it did. It would seem my coven is equally concerned about these abominations. Also, I spoke with Charlotte, and I agree there is more to this Turner than we know. We know he sent that creature here to spy on you, and so it is best to assume he knows or at least suspects your true nature. He may also be enhanced, and with winter fast approaching, even in the deep south, the creatures that assist me are limited, though I am not without my resources. And how do you control the animals, my dear? Henri asks. I do not control animals, Henri. I merely communicate with them, and they assist me time to time. You see that charm that I wear? It is called a Grizz Grizz. It was gifted to me many years ago for an act of kindness. It allows me to enter their thoughts as I entered yours that night to assist you with your transformation. Do not worry, though. I can only enter your mind when you are a wolf, and even as a wolf your mind is much too strong to ever be controlled. Henri and Nicole turn suddenly, and Nicole says, We have a visitor. Henri says, Yes, it would seem Mr. Turner has come to visit, and he isn't alone. The ringing of the door chime seems to confirm their suspicions. As one of the servants appears to tell Henri he has a guest, Mr. Turner to see him. Henri goes to the parlour to meet with his visitor. Mr. Turner, I wish I could say it was a pleasure to see you so soon, but after your crude remarks earlier, I am afraid that your welcome here is worn out. Please state your business, which needs to start with an apology, and so you can then be on your way. Ah, I am sorry to hear that, De Hugh. I have hoped this will be a cordial visit, but I see that your politeness is nothing more than a facade. You may look the part of a gentleman, but in reality, you are nothing more than a beast. You pretend not to be. I pretend nothing, Turner. Now leave my house before I forcibly remove you. Henri had not noticed that he still had his family sword in his hand. He then gripped it tightly to resent the words he had spoken. Turner smiled and said, Are you going to cut me down? Wouldn't you prefer tooth and claw to cold steel? You are a beast after all. I don't need this sword, or tooth, or claw to dispatch with you. You think you know what I am, but I assure you, you have no clue. If you think you think I am one of those near mindless beasts you sent after my cousin. Oh yes, Turner, I know about that. You are most sadly mistaken. A mistake that has cost you your life. The creatures you sent to kill me, I destroyed without so much more of an afterthought. After the utterance of this statement, Henri opens the smallest amount of himself to the true nature. As his size and strength visibly increase, Turner looks visibly shaken as he moves to the door. Henri doesn't allow the transformation to continue. This man is beneath him, assuming his hunting form. Henri now is standing at least six inches taller, with more pronounced muscle. He takes a menacing step towards Turner. Get out of my house, now, he bellows. Turner heads quickly to the door, and with Henri in close pursuit, Turner makes the door and enters the courtyard. Henri strides out, a voice screams in his mind, No, Henri, it is a ruse. Henri enters the courtyard, only to come face to face with the two genetically enhanced soldiers Turner had brought. Both men already plunging the syringes into their legs. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fool. Henri knew he was outmatched. He had battered one of these things, but only in his hybrid form. He had no time to turn, and they would tear him apart if he tried. He knows he only has two chances. The first one, to call on all of his strength and power, and pray that his great sword would allow him to hold his own in this fight. The other, 
was Nicole would help him change again, but at what price? To change in broad daylight for all of the world to see would be contrary to all his uncle had taught him. He could hear the voice of his uncle in his head now. My nephew, you must never change in front of the masses. A friend you may have, but the mob is no one's friend and will seek to slay you and destroy all you love. He calls on all of his strength and attacks. Both of the soldiers are carrying some type of baton. He feels the current thrown through them. The mean to capture him, this he will not allow. As he wades into the fray, he has not been in combat with his sword in centuries, but he has at least kept up the practice. Parry, thrust, swipe and block. One he can match, but not two. These things, he will not call them men, and he will not call them wolves. They are things, but they are skilled and strong, not to mention wearing body armour. Slowly, he is driving them back, when one slips his guard and strikes him with that baton. The electric current surges through his body, more than enough to incapacitate a man. But he was not a man. He would win this day. He would win. But another strike lands home, and Henry is fighting now out of instinct. He hears a voice in his head. Do not worry, Henri. Help is coming. Henri knows he cannot last much longer. The damage he has inflicted on his adversaries hasn't outweighed what he has taken. Another strike, another current, and he will not allow himself to fall. Again, he is struck, and again, till all of a sudden, he realises his sword is no longer in his hand. He then notices he is no longer on his feet. Again and again, these abominations rain blow after blow. Henri's thoughts return to his childhood. He thinks, James, where are you? I am sorry I fouled you. Please, my cousin, I need your help. Two large hawks take flight, and they have a definite purpose, a call that they cannot ignore. They see their target, two men. They circle them, fly into a stoop, a dive at incredible speed, with their razor talons extended. When one of the men says, He is unconscious. Shall we bind him and put him in the trunk? Before he can get his answer, a feathered shaft sprouts from a gap in his body armour. He looks up to see a beautiful blonde woman with a powerful hunting bow in her hands. The genetically enhanced soldier pulls the arrow out, only to see it replaced by another one. And before he can think, a third one enters his throat. With the serum in his system, he ignores the pain of a normally fatal wound and moves menacingly towards the woman. His partner laughs as he pulls his gun. Nothing special about you, bitch. So it's time for you to die. He takes aim when two large hawks on full stoop hit him at an incredible speed. Talons that could crush a man's arm sink deep into his face and blood covers his eyes. Charlotte lets fly another arrow and this one also takes him to the throat. Slowed but still progressing. The other man tries and struggles to free himself from the hawks and all of a sudden Turner yells, Look out you fools! But it's too little, too late. Henri rises to his full height, anger and hatred boiling over. He grips the great bastard sword in both hands and brings it down hard over the man wrestling with the hawks, cleaving him from shoulder to groin. Then he approaches the second, who turns and fires his handgun at Henri. A bullet will not stop him in his rage and is so intent as he swings the great sword in the arc, severing the man's head. Merci, mademoiselle. I am in your debt. He then turns and stalks back to Turner, who is sitting dumbfounded in his vehicle. Turner regains his composure as he hears Henri tell him to get out. And if I ever see you on my property again, I will tear out your entrails and feed them to the catfish. Turner then yells out, Oh, you will see me again, Dehue, as he fires a dart that strikes Henri in the shoulder and then speeds off. Henri collapses to his knees. What had he been injected with? Nicole and Charlotte assist him to the house to lie down. Too many servants have seen the battle, and so the sheriff and coroner are called. The sheriff says, This place sure has its share of trouble. Last year a biker gang, and now two homeless ex-soldiers on drugs. You folks are hiding something that I should know about. Nicole assures the sheriff that there is nothing wrong 
and assures him Mr. Dehue would not mind him looking around. I'm sure, but that will not be necessary, ma'am. Mr. Dehue is a pillar of the community and is known to have valuables around. He should hire some security. It might deter some undesirables. The sheriff and the coroner leave with the bodies. Nicole goes to Henri to check on him, only to find his clothes lying in tatters on the floor. Henri is nowhere to be found. Jim arrived the next day, only to find that instead of a joyous meeting with his cousin, that Henri has gone missing. Nicole explains to Jim everything that has happened, especially the dart that stuck Henri and his disappearance soon after. Jim doesn't waste any time. Jim sees that Bill and the party are made comfortable in the guest wing and then Lou and he are off to find Henri. Lou has the scent and is off like a shot. It's almost a certainty that Henri is in his hunting form by the tracks that they find. The blonde woman wanted to come with us, but she is unusable to say the least. But Lou and I can travel much faster and if there is something wrong with him, it is best not to involve too many people. Jim didn't know what to expect and there was no way of telling what drug had been injected to him and what it did to him. He prayed he would find his cousin and not some mad insane beast. It didn't matter. He was now reunited with his cousin, the last of his family, and by all that was holy, he wouldn't lose him now. His biggest hope was that he was the only one hunting him, and after what Nicole had told him, he was sure that this was a contingency plan to capture him. But that drug that was used set Henri on a wild rampage, and Jim at first wasn't going to bring his rifle, but he rethought that with him possibly not being out here alone. What these other people didn't count on was Jim's ace in a hole, Lou. Henri had about a 12 hour start, but did he have a destination or was this just random? Jim picked up his pace, come on boy, find Henri. The werewolf moved through the foliage. What was he looking for? Why was it so hard to think? The world was still a strange angle. Did it always look like this? He couldn't remember. He picked up a strange sensation. He wasn't alone, and he was being hunted. Foolish. Who in their right mind would hunt him? Who would be that stupid? And he had spent the night in an old shed, and the morning had brought in a heavy mist. It hung to the trees and ground like fabric. He heard a sound. Was it the hunters? He hid himself into the mist and watched as two children came out of the shed. This would be easy. Foolish children. Did they not know that death stalked them? He moved into position to strike. Just a little closer. And they would not even be able to scream. But a small voice in his head held him up. These children were not his enemies. They were innocent. And then he turned his great head back to the forest. And disappeared into the mist. The four-man team is following a tracker into the bayous. They knew their prey was close, and this time they would succeed where their friends had failed. And they were stronger and faster than they had been, and they were ready to take on this monster. They were armed with the same stun buttons, and they would subdue and capture, but they were also prepared to exterminate with extreme prejudice, anything that got in their way. And there would be no slip-ups this time, and they moved through the mist, shrouded by a crops of trees. A beeping sound alerted them that their quarry was near. If only they had knew just how near he was. The great werewolf watched the men. No, not men, he thought. Different, somehow. It mattered little. They were nothing but walking corpses. Their senses were sharpened, but they were not ready for what they were about to receive. They walked through the trees in the mist, and when in a split second, the last man on the line screamed as he was pulled into the mist, whilst the others whirled around, ready for action. The man's head was then tossed back at their feet. Then all hell broke loose, as the werewolf charged into them. The men didn't have time to inject themselves with the enhancement. As the beast tore into them, only one survived the onslaught, and he ran. He ran for dear life. He ran into the largest wolf he or anyone had ever seen. As he stared into the wolf's golden yellow eyes, 
He lost all bodily functions and then fainted dead away. Jim locked eyes with the great werewolf and in a calm, soothing voice, Henri, it's me, James. It's time to go home. Henri didn't hear the words and the only man he saw wasn't his cousin. It was another man trying to stop him. He charged. Jim sidestepped, but the fight was on. Jim knew he couldn't defeat Henri in his hunting form. It would be all he could do to survive. And with no time to change, Lou stepped in front and challenged the great werewolf. Lou knew he cannot hurt Henri and must try to wear him down while Jim becomes the great wolf he was. Henri did not share the same clarity. All he knew was he must kill this interloper. The battle that followed, tooth versus claw, claw versus claw, strike and dodge. Jim starts to concentrate to bring himself to his hunting form before it's too late. Lou is faster than the werewolf, but not tougher. The two move into a dance of death for what seems like hours, but really only about 10 minutes. Finally, Lou's cornered by a tangle of trees. Henri charges him for the kill, but just as with the bear, Lou flows into the mist, avoiding a blow. But as Henri's arm doesn't move, he turns to see another werewolf, larger than he, holding his arm. The two combatants fight blow after blow. And Jim retains his mind, while Henri fights like a cornered beast. Only supernatural creatures can inflict this much damage, and even hope to survive. But, in the end, Jim manages to render Henri unconscious. They collapse into a heap and sleep till the sun rises the next day, burning off the mist. Henri has come out of his drug-induced state and returned to a human form. Henri says to Jim, Ah, hello, cousin. When did you get here? And Jim answered, Two days ago. Henri is feeling very stiff and asks, Did we have a fight? Or something? And Jim answers, Or something. Jim fills Henri in, but he doesn't remember a thing. They piece together what clothes and gear they have. They start to look through the bodies of the hunters that had killed, where they hear a chopper in the distance. They decide to leave for now and to fight this next battle on a field of their choosing. They make their way back to the Dehue estate, and Henri fills Jim on all that has been done. They return to the Dehue estate where all of the pleasantries that were not observed upon arrival are taken into account. While everyone is talking about their next move, Jim receives a phone call. Tom, son, I need a hunter. We have a bear problem. Jim tells him, bears are hibernating now. Tom tells him, not this one. And Jim says, he's big. And he's killed four people so far. While everyone is talking about their next move, Jim receives a phone call from Tom. Son, I need a hunter. We have a bear problem. And Jim tells him, bears are hibernating right now. And Tom tells him, not this one. Jim, he's big, and he's killed four people so far. He's on the move too. He's heading towards Yellowstone. Jim tells him, I can't make it right now, Tom. I hope you understand. Tom tells Jim he will find someone else. Everyone returns to making plans, except Lou. If Walls can look concerned, he does. The lone survivor of the battle with the werewolves manages to get back to his facility telling Turner everything he saw. Turner nods his head and says, Well now, we have two to deal with. He looks at the table where a body has undergone many surgeries, most significantly, armour. Wow, 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 wow. Awesome stuff there from Jim Lawrence. Wonderful, wonderful writing. Hope you guys enjoyed that one as much as I. As ever, please do let us know down below in the comments box what you thought. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. I hope you've all had a cracking start to the week and are getting stuck in. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.